Uh, thanks for being on this call. It's, uh, this is my first, uh, first uh, call that I've been on where I'm presenting. I usually say no because I, I like to learn from people. And I, I just don't, I, honestly, I don't feel like I have that much to offer. I just do things because I love the game. Um, it's just by chance that I've become a coach. I've, I've started a business. My whole dream was to be the best player in the world. And that was it since I was a little kid. And I, that's just the way I live. My, my dream is always to be the best at whatever I do. Um, I decided to start coaching because it was better than becoming a police officer after you graduate from university. Um, so uh, I decided I'll, I'll be the best coach in the world. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to be to the kids that I'm around. So I, I, I hope you don't judge me for anything other than um, I'm just doing what I love to do. Um, so if, if you don't agree with it, it's okay. If you think it's good, it's good. I'm, I'm happy to hear that as well. So um, yeah, I'll just um, introducing myself a little bit to you guys because uh, you probably don't know much about me. And um, I'm, I'm born and raised here in Canada, Vancouver Island. I uh, grew up playing the game uh, 1986. Uh, the moment that changed my life was Diego Maradona uh, winning the World Cup. Um, I was a little kid. And I turned off the TV at that point. I didn't turn it off. I, I turned it on to watch tennis for a few minutes. And I got in a lot of trouble um, because it didn't, like, you're not allowed to turn the World Cup off, obviously. But I didn't know. I was a little kid. And so that moment, I realized there was something important about this game of soccer because uh, I had started to play. But then I found out about Diego Maradona and how everyone celebrated this guy. And they spoke about him. And it was just amazing energy that everyone spoke about this um, this guy and then in Sports Illustrated there was a cover and it said El Rey there was a picture of El Rey that's what it was and, and I cut it out I put it on my wall and, and I found out what El Rey means it's the king and I was like I'm gonna be the king I'm gonna be the next king and then I found in my school I was a little kid I found in my public library and I thought this was the most important book in the whole school uh, autobiography of Pele and I thought every single kid, every single teacher wants to read this book. So I, what I would do is I'd sign it out, I'd read the whole thing, I knew everything about Pele. And when I'd go back, I'd put it back in different spots in the library so no one would ever be able to find it. Then I'd go back the next few days, I'd get it again. I literally had that book from the time I was in grade three until grade seven. I was the only one that signed it out. And I had it every week, because every, every week you have the sign out for the, from the library. So I look back, I'm like, man, that was crazy. But I thought that was normal because I thought the whole world knew about Pele because obviously in that book, it talked about how they stopped world war, not world <laughs> war, but wars. And so I thought everyone knows about Pele, except I realized in Canada, no one knew about Pele. And uh, no one knew about Diego Maradona either in, in terms of kids. So um, <laughs> those were my idols. I didn't get to see many videos on Pele because there was, not, there was no YouTube. Um, but I just imagined what it would be like um, to be Pele because I, I read all of his book um, so that I knew everything that was going on. And my vision in my head always was there's a kid on the beach in Brazil wearing shorts and he's juggling a soccer ball. And he's going on and on and on. And I'm sitting at home not playing, so I need to be outside so I can be better than him. So that was basically my nightmare. Uh, at all times as a, as a young kid was, I need to be outside training because that kid in Brazil right now on the beach is better than me. So that kind of gives you an idea of what my childhood is like. And, and basically I just lived knowing that I would be a professional player. Um, I didn't know that it takes a lot of work to become a professional player. I just knew that I was gonna be one. And I just loved the game. And I worked on my skills. And I got introduced from my house league coach to Curver coaching um, through VHS tapes. And it was an amazing moment in my life. He literally brought a TV to the gym. And it was one of those old box TVs where you put a VHS and VHS video in. And, and I sat there and I watched. I was like, whoa, these kids. I was like, I'm better than these kids. And they were, you know, 9 to 12-year-old PSV Eindhoven kids, Feyenoord kids in Holland. So I was like, I'm better than these kids. And they're in a pro club. I should be in the pro club. So I literally asked the coach, can I take that video? And I still have that VHS. I took the video and I watched it every single day. I made this plan. I said, I'm going to go seven minutes and I'm going to do every single skill. So I would come in the house. I'd turn it on. I'd, I'd watch the scissors. And I'd watch how they do it. I'd have my big water bottle. I'd drink. 
And then I'd go outside for seven minutes and I would just replicate for seven minutes. I don't know why I came up with seven minutes, but that was the plan. So I would do seven minutes. I'm exhausted. I come inside. I watch the next move, step over. I'm drinking water. I'm going outside, timing it, seven minutes. And I would just constantly do this. And I went through the whole Curver series as a, as a young kid, basically, till about 13 years of age. And that, that was basically my idea. So at this point in my life now, I'm thinking I'm Argentinian, I'm Brazilian, and Curvers is what dominates my skill development. So I actually started to believe that I was a, a Brazilian, half Brazilian, half Indian um, human being. So when people would ask me, what are you? I was like, yeah, I'm half Brazilian, half Indian. Because my, my, my personality was, I want to be this Brazilian, South American footballer. I'm going to be Maradona, Pele. And I just made myself believe that. And I literally started to tell people, we'd go, you know, 16, 17 years old, oh, where are you from? What's your originality? I, oh, I'm half Brazilian, half Indian. Imagine that. <laughs> so it's crazy. I know it, it's nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but that tells you a little bit about my mentality of the game. So the game was all about playing beautifully, Joga Bonito, and, and it was South American style. So that continued on as I played, you know, through the provincial teams programs, national training center, going on to university and states. Um, back then, going to the states was kind of unheard of. Um, so in 1996, I, I was recruited to go to school, you know, a number of different schools, but I didn't know anything about American schools. And one school's name was Lindsey Wilson. I was like, what kind of name is Lindsey Wilson? And how can they claim to be national champions at, at NAI? What is this? Like, so I didn't really submit my videos and, and do my work properly because I was on my own. Um, so basically, I blew all my scholarship offers and ended up at a small liberal arts school in New York, Western New York, called uh, Houghton College. And uh, there I just, I went there and, uh, and I got in a lot of trouble because I had moved on my own at 16 years of age to train with the national team. So my mentality was really crazy. It was, it was me against the world mentality. I was living in Vancouver by myself where my parents are on Vancouver Island. So I've moved away and my mentality is you do everything to win. And that was the only thing I knew because the first day I arrived at the national training center, my shoes were stolen because I left them in the locker room. And when I got back, I was like, where are my shoes? My sambas, like brand new sambas. I've just moved to Vancouver, 16 years old. My parents have bought me sambas and they're gone within the first 10 days of me being in Vancouver. And they said, that guy's got him. He's the captain of the under 23 Olympic team for Canada. You're not gonna get him back, but he has them. And, and that was my introduction to the ruthless world of soccer. And for the next two years of my development, it was ruthless obviously at the national training center because I was a young kid training with um, you know, Olympic team, national team players. So what ended up happening was um, I got to university and uh, this is the way I treated everyone else. I just assumed that it was all about winning, all about competing, and you better be better than me. And if you're not, I'm going to rip you up. And uh, I got in a lot of trouble because it was a Christian liberal arts school. And, you know, I was crushing that players. And, and it was just, you know, the mentality that I was um, used to. And uh, that mentality basically carried on because I needed to make it to pro. And I had this idea that I'm going to play four years and I'm going to play pro. And uh, in my third year, there was a huge moment in my career. My coach said to me, he goes, he just, after training, he just said, you're not going to make it as a pro player. I was like, what? Like, this is the first time in three years he's told me that I'm not very good. And he said, you're not going to make it. And he walked away. And I was like, what? What are you talking So I walked behind him. We walked up the hill. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you have no left foot. You always get the ball to your right foot. And you always switch it this way. You never play with your left foot. I said, okay. So he explained to me everything and gave me pictures of why he thought I didn't have a left foot. So I said, no problem. I'll work on my left foot. Um, and that was the last time really, you know, I don't remember how long it took, but I worked really hard. And people ask me now, are you left footed or right footed? And so I just worked because I knew that was the thing I needed to work on. And then, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I got drafted to play in the Toronto Lynx and, and chose to go to Charlotte Eagles instead. Loved the environment and and I ended up playing three or four years, got concussion and retired. And so when I retired, um, the idea was I was very young. I was 24 years old. I was going to go play still. Uh, I had offered to go to Turkey and play and, and everything fell apart. 
But at that point, there was in my life, I had started doing my coaching licenses. And I came to the conclusion, I was like, well, I could play for myself, which is amazing because that's what I've always dreamt of. But I've had an awesome life playing soccer. But I also started coaching when I was 15 years old. And I started coaching these little five-year-olds. And at one point in my small little town, I called the paper guy, the, Ken Zahara was his name. I called him and I said, Ken, can you put an article in the newspaper saying that I'm going to start a soccer school called Tooney Soccer School. I'm going to show up with my blue fluorescent hat and whoever wants to come play with me drops a Tooney and we're going to do skills. And it was just, I'm going to replicate curver moves, right, with the kids. So I just came up with idea of how to coach with these little kids. We came up with these fun little competitions and and so that's basically, you know, I've gone back to 15 years old coaching. I've done the same thing at university. My coach, my assistant coach says to me, one day you're going to be a great coach. And I really took insult to that because I was like, I'm not going to be a great coach. I'm going to be a great player. I'm going to go on to play at the highest level, be the best in the world. He's like, no, I watched the way you play with kids after the games in the foyer. You know, you're hanging out with the kids, playing soccer, pick up. I see that you're going to be a great coach. And I just didn't like that, that he said that. And it didn't make sense to me. I was too, too young to understand that I'm going to be a coach. And, uh, but that day there was, a, you know, when I had my concussion and I couldn't think anymore, I was, I was talking and I forget what I'm talking about. I started to realize that maybe I'll become a coach and I've already done some licensing. So I said, you know what? I can either play for myself or I can affect many, many lives of other kids and make them, something that I want them to be it's like what I want it to be. I can make them passionate about their life. So that day I just made a decision in my head. I was like, I will become a coach and I will affect every child that comes into my life. I'm going to make them passionate about the soccer ball. Like I love the game. And uh, that's how my coaching career started. Um, from there, I was working with two kids here, three kids here, five kids here. Uh, I would drive across the street in my Toyota Corolla put all my balls in, get to the one side, get to the south side, get to the east side. I was hustling. Um, and, and I just came up with a plan. I was like, if I can run one session a day, I can make a living. I'll make enough to survive. And I would just go out there. I'd give them everything. And, and all of a sudden, it just grew. That kid would tell his friend, and then two would come, then four would come, and eight would come. And then all of a sudden, I've got two sessions going back to back. And after a few years, you know, I've started in 2004, and now I've got 500 kids. Um, by the by the time I'm, you know, six, seven years later, I've got 500 kids coming a week and I'm not a club. I don't I have any affiliation with anyone. Um, now clubs are sending me um, kids from different areas. And, um, I just start to realize I was like, you know, I, I'm I'm introducing all these skills to these kids. And I'm actually getting people saying in the games when I go, watch, don't do those Parmar skills. I was like, what, what do you mean? Don't do those Parmar skills. You know, you're going to lose the ball. Don't, don't lose the ball. I could not believe that someone would say, you're going to lose the ball, right? Because the whole point of the game was to enjoy the ball, not get rid of the ball. And what I started to realize is people that I was coming around, the coaches, for them it was about get the ball, give the ball somewhere else. And if it's, if it's in their um, stress, get rid of it. Yeah, when in doubt, get rid of it, right? So – I just couldn't understand this because me as a player growing up and playing now, I'm all about the ball. So how can you get rid of the ball? Because we need to crush the ball. We need to love the ball and, and, and take care of it as a team, as an individual. So I just uh, got really frustrated uh, over those seven years where I was running these programs. And I said, you know, right now, everyone enjoys having their kids come to me because I developed them and they go back. But I need to have real influence on the kids that I work with. So how am I going to have influence? I can start my own club. How am I going to do that? So I, I came up with some ideas. I approached the local association. They're like, it's impossible. You cannot start a club. It, all the territories are occupied. You cannot take over someone's territory. I was like, yeah, but I have these awesome ideas. Like, no, you know, that club is there. That club is there. I was like, I have, I'm going to go to this facility. They're like, you're interfering. Well, how about if I start an all-girls club? Like, yeah, that's a great idea. But you're still interfering. Um, futsal club. Okay, good. Where are you going to get your players from? I don't know. In the winter, they'll come train with me, but then they'll go back to their clubs. So nothing worked, you know. And then the lady said, well, you know what? Come to our club. Present your ideas. Maybe you can run the program in our club. And that's how Futuro started. On October 1st, 2011, Futuro officially launched. So 
um, it was nine years, uh, October 1st, that I started this academy. So that gives you a background uh, and hopefully I didn't fall asleep. So go ahead, Paul, we'll, we can discuss now from here. Thank you for that background. Yeah. Um, so you're up in Canada, if a lot of people don't know, he's up there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ottawa, Canada. Ottawa is the nation's capital. Um, we live in weather where it goes to 40 plus in the summer and negative 40 in the winter. We have the biggest variance of temperature in the world for capital cities. So uh, we play from May until end of August, early September. And then we start prepping to go indoors in the domes. So that's how we, we live here. I put turf in my backyard. So we play from March till when the snow comes, we, we run on the snow so that we can still play for a few more days. So, yeah, so we're now in our fall, uh, fall phase where we're transitioning to start going indoors soon, but we'll try to go till the end of October, early November. Just so you know about the weather a little bit. Well, um, Sanjeev, I know that, um, you know, you have some videos and you also have, you're gonna share like um, a really cool, what I, what I loved about, you know, your stuff you know, I, I could really tell that development was at the front, front mm -hmm. of everything that you were doing. It was very player centered. It was, you could tell the individual was getting a lot of attention. And I think that's what it's all about, right? When you're in youth development, you know, there, there's team success and you want your team to win. But at the end of the day, you know, the best way for your team to win, but even more importantly for the individual is, is that attention. And I saw that in what you were doing with your videos. And I know today you were gonna share with us a little bit about your core skills model. Absolutely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it up right now so you can all see it. Can you all see it right now? Yes, we could see uh, most of it. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So I'm gonna leave this up. So I'll just kind of talk about it a little bit here so you can see it. Um, I know the writing is very small, so I'll just I'll, I'll walk you through the model and then I'm going to give you videos. And when you guys watch the videos, we can discuss different things. And if you have questions, feel free to ask. So the model is it's all about the individual and basically it's um, the foundation phase and, and foundation phase could be anywhere until 12, 13, 14, depending on the kids uh, puberty when they hit puberty, basically. So um, for me, there's different stages of a kid's uh, model, um, kid's development, and for me, the first one that's the most important is mentality, and I think that's something that you create at home uh, from a very young age. And unfortunately, I think um, what we create in at home is very different some, sometimes than what we want on the field. So the mentality for me, number one, and and I know this goes against everything in the world right now about winning and losing, it's, is, is this player naturally competitive? Um, and I think that's created at home. Uh, and for me, for example, it's been created in my home with my kids because I play with them. And so our development model is not, let's do curver skills, it's let's you and I play one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's soccer, hockey, tennis, basketball, we're just gonna play and compete. And from a young age, I remember people used to say to me, do you play and let them win? I was like, I'm very strategic on how I teach them. I'm very strategic on how I win and how they win because they need to win sometimes to feel like they want to come back. They need to lose and feel that, that I'm losing and I hate that feeling, but they need to suffer a little bit. That's my perspective. Some parents think that's insane. You, you don't want to make your little child suffer, but I did um, from a very young age. I, I wanted them to suffer and feel that, okay, you can win, but you can also lose if you don't work hard. So within that mentality, uh, you got to work hard, um, obviously, to compete. Um, and you got to be always thinking, if I lose today, is that the end of me? Or can I win in a different way? So I did so many different things in the one-on-one. -on -one. I would basically be the role model for my child so they can watch and see me do all these skills. And he's trying to get the ball, but he can't get it because I pull it back. I pull it this way. I fake this way. I'm screaming and yelling and celebrating and making it so exciting that he's looking and saying, this is fun. I need to make it fun for myself too. So I'm going to celebrate when I score. I'm going to do an airplane. Uh, I'm going to scream, goal, 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 goal. Right. And so the mentality is being formed from a natural competitive player 
growth mindset. They're starting to explore because they're watching me and he's seeing me do this fake this way and go that way. So he's starting to explore these ideas. So now I'm seeing we're playing and, and he's doing a move. And I'm like, hey, where did you learn that move? And I know where he learned that move, but I'll question in such a way where he's going to respond. In like his answer was in my mind. And that was always a answer that my child would give me. And so I started to realize that role modeling was a huge thing in, in this child's life. And so I was able to do that. Obviously not every parent can do that. They cannot necessarily role model exactly what they want, but they can role model the idea of, of playing, of being active, and if, if, if the kid's not active from a young age, then you can't get some of this mentality. The resilience part obviously comes in when, when the kid is playing and losing, then are they going to persevere? Are they going to come back and, and want to compete again? Um, and, and, and so little by little, what we did was um, we just played lots of games. And then my child wanted to do different things on his own because he had so much fun with me. Then he would go and play. He'd call, make a little World Cup up by himself and started playing one-on-one -on -one with himself against the wall. And so he became independent. Um, and when we played, sometimes I would, I would be very aggressive. Sometimes I'd pull him down. I would take him down. And then and he like, hey, you can't do that. I was like, yeah, you're right. I can't do that, but you can do this. And so I started to teach like – basically coming all the way to the line of what is right and wrong. And usually at home, you know, it's, it's sharing is caring and everything is proper. Right. So I try to push the limits right to the edge where the child is thinking, okay, I can do this or I can't do this. So sometimes he'll kick me and then I'll give a yellow card. I'm like, you can't do that. Right. Or, or but he'll try to take a tackle and he hit me a little bit. Okay. You can do that. Right. So uh, it's just trying to push the limits to teach the kid that, there's um, a competitive world out there and that you have to be very competitive. So um, one of the things, um, so I'll, I'll show you now is, is a video here of a player. Uh, let, let me know if you can see, can you see it fully? Yes. Okay. So this is a kid, um, he was 10 and a half years old here and he's very technical. Um, and, and when he, um, when he was, oh, I did, I played it too early. So he was very technical with the ball. And, and at U9, he actually got cut. He was in my program from five to eight years old. And then we have tryouts. I was like, you know what? You're going to be on the team as a goalkeeper because he was playing a little bit of goalkeeper. I just think, I didn't think he was very coordinated. He didn't move well, couldn't run. His technique was not very good. And so I told his dad, we're going to select him as a goalkeeper. And his dad's like, no, we, we want to play out. And he's like, give him a few days. I was like, okay, I'll give him 30 days. You know, we're in the fall program. Let him train, see how he does. In 30 days, he proved that he was a lot better than a lot of the kids. He improved so much. And so over time, I would just keep giving him challenges. So one of the challenges I gave him, I was like, look, your footwork's good. You're always looking at the ball. You can master, you've mastered the ball in a lot of different ways. I'm going to give you um, a tie to put on your eyes. I want you to practice every day. And so I want you to work on your outplaying skills. I want to work on ball touches against the wall. So what he would do is, I have a lot of videos on him too. He would send me a daily video. He would bounce the ball against the wall and he would hear the sound. So he started to hear the sound of the ball bouncing. He couldn't see it. And he was able to see, hear the ball and, and, and see it with his feet and touch the ball. And he'd hit one touch, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. And obviously, I mean, it's not great. He's a little kid. But by the end, he's actually able to lay one touch back and forth, 40 seconds, without making any mistakes. For me, that's a huge, huge accomplishment because I've tried to do this. It's not easy. Um, so for this kid, mentality-wise, he's taken the idea that, okay, my coach has given me a challenge. And he's up to the challenge. And so in my academy, this is what happens is that we use role modeling. So I've used this video, for example, with my 2009s, my 2010s, my 2011s to say, hey, guys, this is the level you need to get to. So we're going through the core skills. But once you get decent at the core skills, this is a level where you don't have to see the ball no more. Your feet see it. You hear everything. You're aware of the surroundings. So... And in terms of mentality, I think he hits a lot of things here in terms of imitation, problem solving, uh, taking responsibility and being independent on their own in terms of development. Uh, any questions there about that? I think that's really cool that, you know, you're getting mentality out of that 
that experience, right? That you can recognize, you know, kids has a strong mentality mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily like this, this fierceness. It's like a determination. It's an independence. It's a responsibility, which is a strong mentality. I think that's really, really great to recognize that. Mm -hmm. Because here's one of the things I think you guys will probably agree. Sometimes when we think of mentality, we always think of like this narrow minded thing, like, okay, he has the mentality to play or, or she doesn't have the mentality to play. But there's so many things inside of mentality that we need to look at, right? Like we even talk about in our academy, one of our seven pillars is spiritually aware. What does that mean? It's not, it's not religious. It's, are you fair? Are you playing with fair play? right like and that's part of our mentality like you can be ultra competitive and be fair play right be hard working and so these are very important things i think part of mentality that we need to develop as the as a, a holistic individual i think so the next phase i think is um functional movement skills physical literacy i think it's a huge thing that um, is talked about these days around the world um, but I think in North America, for sure, and now I hear in, in, in Europe as well, it's something that's really missed, um, both in, in the physical education department at schools, at home, because we don't allow our children to go outside without us supervising them. There's no chance in the world that they're ever going to climb a tree, right, because they're going to fall off. And there's no way if they kick the ball over the fence that they're going to climb over a fence and jump over, because if they climb over, they fall, they break an ankle. So these things aren't allowed, right? So um, what I think and for me, for my players in my academy is that uh, we have this little physical literacy program. So I'm going to start the uh, video here. I don't know if the volume, is the volume too loud? Or is it okay? A little bit. Okay. So this is our physical literacy program for four to six year olds, four to seven year olds, three year olds. And uh, we just do crazy things in here. They run around, we play for 45 minutes. It's a parent child program. So I, I basically just tell them what we're gonna do and the parents play with their kids. Uh, we set up, you know, lots of different things. I make it like a, sometimes a geography lesson. I want them to jump. So I'm gonna pretend like you're a kangaroo in Australia. Where's Australia? And, and then we're gonna go on and we're gonna become a bear and we're gonna fly and we're gonna go to the next country. So. I'm trying to give them a geography lesson. I'm trying to introduce animals to them, sounds to them, and they're gonna hop, they're gonna jump, they're gonna run. There's multi-directional movements here. Um, they're gonna be doing skipping. You know, we think of skipping as a very simple movement that we could do in our generation because that's what we learned to do. But in, the, in today's generation, kids don't skip. They don't know what leaping is. They don't know how to throw a ball, and, and if, your child at four, five, six, seven years old can't throw a ball. I can guarantee you at nine, 10 years old, they cannot volley a ball. Because if they can't throw and catch, how can you volley a ball when the ball's coming in the air? How can you control a ball in the air as a center back when it's coming to your head? How do you know it's gonna hit you? You don't know. Because you've never thrown a tennis ball, you've never thrown a football, you've never played with different sized balls. So if kids don't play with different sized balls at a young age, they're not gonna be able to receive a ball in their chest because it's gonna hit them in the stomach or it's gonna hit them in the face. So with these young kids, we do everything from catching balls to scooping balls to running with balls. They're working on balance. We play with balloons because what I do with balloons is when you throw a balloon up, the timing of the balloon, it's a lot slower than a soccer ball, obviously, or than a futsal ball that's heavier. So now they can judge that ball coming down. So that's where I start introducing juggling. Is, is to three and four year olds is how to juggle a soccer ball is to juggling a, a balloon. Um, so we'll do, you know, crossover steps, um, crossing the midline. So something that, you know, probably isn't really discussed much is, is crossing the midline of your body. Your body, you have your right, your left, but a lot of times you're throwing this way, you're throwing that way. But when you kick a ball, you actually cross your midline with your legs. Right when you do uh, flips and you're, you're you're doing cartwheels, you're crossing the midline. So for kids, it's not necessarily um, normal to be able to cross the midline to be able to do it naturally. So we have to introduce these ideas to the kids at these young ages. So you've seen here in, in this video, it's just little kids doing tons and tons of activity with very little standing um, and, and very little. Uh, where they sit and listen to me, it's, it's just go. And, and when I'm explaining things, 
So uh, I'm just uh, opening up the model here. You'll see number two, functional movement skills. You'll see all the different movements that we go through. Uh, what I do is I, I don't have um, much concern if the kids aren't paying attention. I basically am, am educating the parents. And then I'm saying, okay, we're going to do this jumping. And I tell the parents how to do it. And then they'll do it with the kids so that I'm not responsible for having to oversee every single kid. And to be quite honest, you'll watch my program. You'll think, oh, you were meant to coach four to six-year-old kids. I can tell you it's, it's the program I hate to do. I absolutely despise it. I do not look forward to it, and I stress out about it. It's the only session in the whole week out of the seven days that I stress out about because I feel like I need to entertain these kids. My voice is going to be gone. I'm going to be sweating like crazy, and it's going to go from one to the next to the next within two minutes. So within 45 minutes, I might go through 20 things, 25 things, and if it doesn't work, I need to go to the next. So I'm really stressed out about it, but I only do it because I have a little daughter that, that's at that age. So that's my physical literacy program. Any questions about that? Not necessarily a question, but um, I definitely appreciate what you're talking about as far as tapping into an imagination. I think that um, a lot of our coaches in our club they struggle with that because you have to be able to be imaginative. You know, we do a lot of those same things with our three and four year olds where it's like, all right, let's go to the zoo and then we're going to take our ball to the park. And um, so I don't know if there's any things that you work with your coaches or with your parents where you like stress that and how do you develop that, tap into that imagination. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so one thing you should know about our academy is that we only have 150 kids in the club, and we only have four or five coaches. Um, this is because I have a philosophy, and, and what you saw there was part of the philosophy was the energy levels are extremely high. And you'll know, as you just mentioned that, to get parents or adults to have that high level of energy is really difficult. To have a, an adult buy into the idea of yoga bonito, it, it, it's, it's very complicated. It sounds beautiful. It sounds like, yeah, I want my kids to go through this. I, I, I'm going to teach this. But when you get on the field and you have the stress of 12, 14 kids on there and you're thinking, I got to run the session, I got to be organized, and I got to be energetic, and I got to look at for details individually, it, it just doesn't happen in my thinking. It doesn't happen so much. So I, I don't really bring in coaches. So I run a lot of the programs for the young kids. I have two young coaches um, who are with me since they were nine years old. They run our seven to 10 years of age program where um, they do the, the junior academy and the U9 and U10. And they're technically incredible players when they played and they know exactly what the model is for teaching and, and they know the energy levels I'm looking for. So what I'll do is sometimes I'll come in and I'll jump in and run a session here and there. And, and they, that way, every few weeks, they're revised on the energy needs to be so high in case they drop it a little bit. They're university kids. Um, they're both engineering, very smart, dean's list type kids. But um, they're not kids, they're adults now. But uh, we work together. So I'll, then, I'll be watching the session over there while I'm running session. I'll, and I'll just walk over and I'll be like, hey, Josh, you, you got to add this into yours. You, you know, you're doing this one-on-one. -on -one. You got to add this little deception into this. Okay, perfect. Add it in. So the teamwork is amazing. Um, he'll walk over to my session while it's going on. He's like, dude, why are you doing that? And he'll ask a question. I'll be like, okay, this is why we're doing this. And, and we collaborate constantly. Um, he'll give a suggestion. I'm like, okay, let me try it. And so there's no real hierarchy in our club. Uh, obviously, I'm the owner, I'm the technical director, but it doesn't matter. Like, I'll come in, I'll run something. I'll come in and, and I'll be like, hey, try this or do that. And be like, okay, let's do it. Or he'll come over and you do this. And so it's constantly working back and forth um, between us. Um, but the energy level, for example, when I work with little kids, I, I'm just trying to think of stories. So, for example, I'll have to uh, bow, bow nets or, or pug nets. So I'll say, okay, all the kids, come and sit down in the pug nets. And uh, I'll make up a story. Okay, 
the big bad wolf is coming after you. I'm in a huff and I'm in a puff and I'm going to blow you. And they all run away and they run into the next goal or next time they'll collect the ball and they'll run with the ball. So, you know, we just make up a story. And so in their head, there's a full imagination or I'll be like, okay, parents, you're a tree. Parents, pretend like you're a tree. Your legs are the tree stump. Kids, I want you to climb that tree. What you have to do is you have to get on the back of the parent and you have to go all the way around and you have to get to the back again. How are you going to do it? And so I might even jump on one of my coach's backs, right? And I'll be like, okay, watch this. I'm going to jump on his back and I'm going to go around. So the parents see that it's completely normal. Kids see that the coach is psycho and he's trying to do this. So I'll do the demo. So I never, ever am an adult in the, in the situation of these kids. They just look at me as one of their peers. Okay, he's got a little bit of discipline that he wants here. Uh, it's chaos. He's crazy. He's louder than us. Um, so they just, they, they want to be there, right? And, and I think that's a missing link, I think, in the most part for um, coaches where they can't come down to the kids' level. It's simple as I get down on my knees or I sit down on the ground on my bum and I'm, I'm at their level. I put my arms around them and, you know, we're having a big party together. So simple things. That it's not rocket science. It, it doesn't make um, me a good coach or anything. It's just that's what I do with the kids, I think. Do you guys yeah, I have a question for you. Yep. Uh, I mean, you're, I think at these really young ages, I think ideally what we'd like to do is find somebody that has that pre, pre-elementary education that understands how to work with kids that age who also maybe is a af- af- former athlete or a former player themselves. And, and I'm always on the lookout for that individual. But even for the older, um, the older age groups, I mean, your energy, your passion, and your enthusiasm is, is contagious. I mean, I, c- I can see that just from – the zoom meeting but with the rest of your staff i mean you got a big staff i'm sure so how do you how do you relate that to to get your energy your passion enthusiasm for the academy out to your staff do you train them on that or do you select them like that or or what 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 do you do yeah like i said we only have 150 kids so our, our our staff is very small there's myself josh and christian who coached u9 10s and the junior academy at 7 8 i take 11 12s 13s um and then jed davies takes 14 plus and he's our tactical master he's incredible you probably all follow him if you don't you should follow him on twitter he's analyst he's been an analyst for iran's national team and auto fury and and he's written a few books you know bielsa and so we all work together there's only four or five of us that coach i've got some apprentice coaches that come in so kids that i've coached in the past who come in and i'm like you know what you just come join me assist me work with me. I'll get you to do a demo. I'll get you to play with the kids. I'll get you to take that group of three kids. When I give a a suggestion to the kids, I'll be like, so for example, we might have U9s or U10s and we're playing a a 3v3 game, for example. In that game, I might say, okay, guys, uh, I'll lead them on to an answer, but I won't give them the answer. I'll say, okay, we're going to, we're going to try to defend and win that ball from them. Okay. So how are we going to defend? You three go together, work. You three go work together. Uh, Jacob, come over here. You you just oversee them. Don't give them any suggestions. Just listen. And then I'll walk around and I'll listen to the kids. And I'll say, you got 30 seconds to come up with something. And then I'll go talk over to Jacob, one of my assistant coaches. I'll say, Jake, come up with this idea in your mind. See how you can present this after the next three minutes after we play. So I'll give them, I'll lead them on to something. I'll say, here's what I'm looking for. I'm going to see it. When I see it, I might even tell you I've seen it. But next time they come back, you give them a little bit more suggestion on how to do it. So it's kind of drip feeding all the time. I'm drip feeding my coach. I'm drip feeding the kids. But the kids are actually coming up with everything on their own. So as part of our mentality was problem solving and and collaboration and and thinking of ideas. So now we're developing the mentality. They're collaborating. They're problem solving, which is the, the key part of our whole model is problem solved through every single situation. So now coaches are learning. They're seeing the way I'm doing it. They're seeing, okay, he's not just giving an answer all the time. He's giving them ideas, but eventually they come to the conclusion of the answer, which is guided discovery, right? Everyone talks about guided discovery. I just do it a little bit differently. I just, um, I don't like to sit there and question and question and question because kids are like, oh, this is boring, right? So th- then they go and do their own problem solving. I don't know if it's right. I don't know if you guys disagree or agree with that. What do you guys think? I think children should be made to think for themselves and solve problems, like you say. Mm-hmm. 
I think um, so. One of the things that we have in the club. So when you first come, so if you brought your child to the club, in the first couple of days, what's going to happen is they're going to kick a ball away. I'm going to walk over to that child in a very serious tone. And I'm going to say, "That's the last time you will ever kick the ball away at Pichero." And when they look at me, they're like, they're, they're freaked out. And, and I make it very clear at U9, U10, you know, whenever they come and join us, I'm like, "We don't kick it away. If you got the ball as a left back and you give it away, I'm okay." You kick it away, I'm not okay. You have to figure out how to problem solve. I will give you all the tools on how to problem solve here. We have our core dribbling skills. You're going to learn them. Eventually, after that, you're going to learn deception on how to use your dribbling or passing. And you're going to be able to create 2v1 situations everywhere on the field. And we'll talk about that more later. But that kid knows now we don't give away the ball at Futuro. We lose the ball constantly, and we call them Futuro goals when our goalie gets it plays it to our center back, we lose the ball, and they get scored on. And it happens all the time at every age for us. It's a futuro goal, and everyone laughs about it. Parents stress about it when they first join. I just make it clear, look, this is the way we play. We're going to play beautiful soccer. Your children are going to be problem solvers, and we're going to be collectively able to problem solve in a couple of years' time. It's hard to do, very hard to do. But the reason I'm able to accomplish that is because I only have a staff of five, six coaches. And, and they understand that this is the only way we do things. And they're only here because that's the way we do things because they believe it just as much as I do. Paul, well, what do you think? No, I think that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, I always say coaching is science. Coaching is really uh, an art form, you know, and you have to really kind of just feel out every individual situation. But that philosophy, I think, is a, a beautiful philosophy, and it, it's the right philosophy for, for player development, you know? Mm -hmm. Future old goal, scored against us. I've had many of those scored against my teams at the younger yeah. ages. But I think, um, I think, you know, you explaining it to parents and you creating this, this understanding throughout the club is, is also key, right? Mm -hmm. not, you know, what I'm impressed with, Sanjeev, is your leadership and your passion, you know, and I think that's – that's what you can do and you can you can you can run that through a club obviously from you all, all the way through the people now sometimes your club is bigger and you got a thousand people so what's the trick now of running it through a thousand people or, or 500 families or whatever it is right so um so you know there's different challenges but i do think it starts with your leaders in each of these different phases of development mm -hmm. I think, uh, I mean, you have a great point there. Uh, like, I always think about it. I'm like, it's so nice. You know, that club's got 6,000 kids. They have the best athletes. And I'm like, I would hate to be that person that has to organize those kids and, and be making everyone happy and trying to impart my philosophy on those 6,000 people who are not interested in my philosophy as it is. All right. So in my world, I make it very clear. On October 1st, 2011, when I first had my meeting with the parents, I said, there's a rock right here. I'm going to drop this rock in this pond. I said, this ripple effect is going to be having an effect all over the province, all over the nation, all over North America. That was my meeting. And people are like, what are you talking about? I said, this is my idea. This is my philosophy. We're going to play this way. And I want to change the way people think about the game. Little by little, hopefully people start to see the way we play. We don't have the best players. We don't have the best athletes. We don't have the most technical players. Whatever we get, though, I will make you a much better player. And if you're willing to, like, willing to challenge yourself, I will try to fulfill your potential. That's, that's my only promise I can give to anybody. So when you come to Futuro, <laughs> we will give you all the tools possible to try to make you the best you can be. And, and if you want more, I'm going to give you more. And, and so this was actually part of um, some, some a part of the discussion I was going to have is we have kids that could be nine years old playing with our 12 year olds. We have girls that are 12 year olds that could be playing on our 13 year old boys team. It, gender doesn't mean a thing. Age doesn't mean a thing. For me, it's just a number. If you are capable, you are playing. If you need to be challenged mentally, then, then we're going to bump you up. If you need to be um, given something physically, I'm going to play you down a year because it's going to help you physically, maybe at the adolescent years. If you're technically not as good as players at your own age, maybe we're going to bump you down for a little while and see how it goes, then bump you back up. So there's constant movement up and down. Every, every kid in our club is going to get their three training sessions plus a game. 
but the ones that are really, really keen, they're going to get, and that's probably 30 to 40% of them, they're going to get two, three more sessions a week. They're going to get to stay after their training session, go join that session. And, and we're just a big family. Our coaches don't say, oh, no, I don't want that kid in my session. I've got 16 kids for my plan. Now I have 17. It doesn't work like that. It's, you know what? Hey, Chad, um, this kid's done so well. Can I have him bump up with you today? Yeah, no problem. I'll text him before a session or I'll, even after my session. Jed, this kid was amazing. I want her to stay with you. Can she stay for the next session? You know, it's her first opportunity to play. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I'll throw her in. Or Jed will come over and say, hey, uh, can I have him come down with you today? Or it, it just works like that in our academy. Like, it's just a family. Like, you know, you're in your house and you talk to your wife or you talk to your child and you come up with a plan. This is just the way it is at Futuro. And even my parents, when I write messages, I'm like, Futuro family. You know, I call them our family, you know. And, and you know, when they're come, to, when, for example, the first time your child's going to come, they're going to be told, hey, come over here. Let's introduce ourselves. Guys, introduce yourself, shake hands. And then by the end of the time they shake hands and learn each other's name, I tell, I'll tell that kid, hey, Ryan, you have to know everyone's name. By the end of the session, if you don't know it, we're going to make you do something really crazy. And you know, they're like, oh, my gosh, what's he going to make us do? So by the end of the session, they know their name and everyone knows each other, and, and they're already part of the family. So the family feel is, is the most important for me in, in this little world that we live in because now play up play down it's not a it's not an ego hit right like oh you're gonna play down today okay no problem i'll play down you know we're gonna combine three age groups and make a team to play today okay no problem oh but that guy sucks they don't think like that they're just gonna play it's futuro that's the way we do it so it's a bit of a culture we're trying to establish uh, we have established in our in our club you know we'll have like uh, street soccer four to six year olds have street soccer so my daughter comes to our session with me for 45 minutes but she gets street soccer twice a week where they come. And this is crazy. If, if you as a parent dropped your kid off, you'd be like, I'm not bringing them back probably. So what happens is I got my session going on over there. Jed's got his session over there. And over there, you got your little four and six year olds. They have three things they do. They come, they collaborate. They decide to pick up, play some sort of pickup soccer. It doesn't look like soccer. They want to chase the rabbit that's in our park. They chase the chipmunks. And then they play uh, a little freeze tag game of some sort. And, and they just sit around, do whatever. Our session's finished. I come over to the four and six-year-old, and they're still playing. Sometimes they play, sometimes they sit, sometimes they goof around. But this goes on two days a week outside of their session. So they're coming three <laughs> days a week just to goof around. And so parents, I have them on WhatsApp. I'll just send them something. I'm like, hey, this is what independent learning is. So that when they show up to my session, they're like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. This is actually what it's supposed to be, not not – what are they doing over here? They're wasting time. I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm watching these kids do nothing. They don't stress. They do. They just relax and watch the kids goof around. And, and for me, that is just gold. It, it, it's part of the gold mine effect that we're trying to create here, right? Like these kids come, they learn off each other. And now what's happened is one of our girls, Sadie from our O3, she is, you think I'm energetic? You should see this girl. She's nuts. She comes in. She's never coached in her life. She comes and runs a session with these kids. That's the most incredible session I've ever seen. Parents are like, who's that girl? She's amazing. I'm like, yeah, she is amazing. One of my coaches left my session to go watch her and play with her. He was a 16-year-old boy. She's a 16-year-old girl. He's like, I'm going over there. That looks like a lot of fun. So he's left my session the other week, and he's gone and joined these little four- to six-year-old street soccer, and it's become a proper session. And for me, that was like, that's it, right? Like we're creating a culture and an environment that these kids are going to thrive in forever. So that's the family. So I'll take you on to uh, the next part. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little slow. This is already 15 minutes in. I, I, I probably should get through quick things quickly. Uh, I don't want to waste your time. So this is our juggling model. Can you see the video? Yep. Okay, so I'll just I'll take it to the beginning. So. So in our juggling model, we've got uh, different stages. And, and I came up with a session this, um, this during COVID where I came up with like 40 different juggling ideas. And, and juggling for me is not soccer. It's not going to make you the best soccer player in the world, but every single professional player can juggle a ball. They, they have control of the ball. And the way I tell kids is either the ball controls you or you control the ball. So this is the first way for you to start to learn how to control the ball is juggle a ball. So... So what this was is, is, is one of the stages of our um, juggling. It's part number eight in our juggling model. So it's part nine. Uh, I'll play it again so you can see it. So there's a ball on the ground, 
and you're trying to juggle and you're trying to tap the ball. So you're working on balance, which is in your functional movement skills, right? You're trying to control a ball and get an idea of how am I going to touch that ball and control the ball at the same time. And so I've got little standards for them and, and I'll send it out. So this month, this is your juggling log. Can you come up with the standard? So the first standard is always good. If you notice at the end, so even if you achieve that first standard, you've done a good job. Then there's excellent. Uh, so let me see what their standards are. So it's good. Five toe taps, eight taps is very good. Excellent professional world club. So the way I've worded it, it's not, you are not good. If you get to this level, it's, if you get this, you're really good already. And you want to get to world class. You want to be Lionel Messi. That's world class. Let's see if you can get there. So obviously all the kids are trying to get to that standard. So that's, that's juggling. Um, and you all know juggling. There's so many different ways to, to do juggling. Um, this is, this is really cool. And I'll share this with you. Um, this is, we, this is now part of our next part of our model. Um, uh -oh. did I do something? Oh, share screen. Yeah. Okay. So this, do you see this? So this was, um, if you watch this, you'll be able to see, um, a lot of kids in a circle. And this is part of our outplaying model. So what, what we did, we, did, we called it the outplaying World Cup. We came up with this whole idea over a season where every team is gonna have their own little World Cup tournament. So these are different age groups doing World Cup outplaying skills. They had 20 seconds. And in 20 seconds, they had to come up with all these creative skills, whatever they could come up with. So this was our way of providing them a homework program. So they would now go home, they'd come up with this idea of how to put skills together and, and, and they present it and then all the kids would be in a circle and they'd be screaming and yelling and making it hostile and sometimes coming up with the Icelandic chant uh you, you know you're doing the wave the Mexican wave so you'll see different things. and so two players would play off so it'd be one player for 20 seconds and the next one would come and then the kids would vote and we would have a winner and a loser and then we would have, we'd keep track. And we, we actually made like a whole World Cup outlook. It was called Uruguay 1930. And our goal was to get through every single World Cup from 1930 to present. And uh, we'd have a winner. We'd give them award. We actually messed it up when we did it, it was the first time. Because we'd have a, a winner and a loser. And the loser would get knocked out. And so you'd go through the next stage. But that defeated the whole purpose because... In our vision, yeah, it was cool. We're going through this whole World Cup thing, but the kids actually got knocked out after the first round. Didn't actually have to go home and do any work anymore. So we scrapped the idea. But during the COVID nineteen, what I did was I came up with the same concept, and I'll I'll play that video for you. And so during COVID nineteen, because there was nothing going on um, with soccer, um, I came up with the idea of, of running a COVID nineteen World Cup. And so you'll see a little bit of this. Tell me if you can see it. Can you see it? Okay, yeah. good. So this is a little three-year-old kid, and, and the rest are between uh, 6 and 12, 13 years of age. So what they would do is they'd send me a 20-second video on WhatsApp, and, and I had a whole standings uh, or schedule of who's going to play. So two kids would play each other. They'd send me their video. I'd put it on Instagram, and then on Instagram, it'd be, who do you vote for? And basically, it became a, a, a friend, like a, a popularity contest and, and that was okay with me but it was these kids are actually going every day and every third day they have a competition they're working on their skills and routines so for about i think it was about 45 days i had this competition going so kids are actually training on their own in their backyards in their in their basement upstairs wherever it was and it allowed me to keep them engaged and they were always excited who am i playing next oh i gotta prepare really well for this and so parents were like hey my kid's doing skills all day so i was able to actually get all my kids to be doing technical work in the time of covid19 when they were stuck at home which was i thought it was really really cool so you see you see a lot of kids doing lots of different things and you'll see them from little age like this one here is four years old three years old all the way up to 13 years of age and I thought that was a real success for us. Any any questions about our outplaying? Paul, anything? Love it. No, man, it's 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 culture. You know, you're creating a culture in the club. It's the culture of development, what we call here at the academy. You know, it's just just loving football, loving practicing, loving training, loving the ball, you know, and it's that you know, I mean, that's, that's real development right there. I, I really, really, really love it. 
it's more than just the game on the weekend, you know, or or what's the next event or whatever else. <coughs> that daily, that daily learning and culture and motivation, and uh, it's it's um, it's what I love. Mm -hmm. Agree. So the next part of the model number five is protect and escape. So we've come up with the idea of protecting the ball and how do you escape? A lot of kids they protect the ball, but they don't have necessarily the skills to escape. So we've come up with a number of skills here um, that we thought were important. So from one to nine, uh, and one of them is called the Peshis Lido. Peshis Lido used to play for Sheffield United. He was a Canadian player and he used to do this move. So in case you're wondering what Peshis Lido is, you'll know most of these moves. I'll, uh, I'll put on a video of our protect and escape moves. So, so from here, basically I got a it's bunch just, of moves I'll, I'll, I'll talk about them. And so it's just going through, this was a, a moment that we filmed by chance and it was, it was just, it ended up giving us all our different moves. It was during our summer camp. So I was going through all the different moves. And so what it is, is I want the kids to be able to protect the ball in all different situations because as a fullback and you protect, it's very different than as a holding mid or as an attacking mid or as a striker because a striker you might receive back to goal. Right, so when you receive back to goal, there's a certain amount of moves that you want to be able to play, uh, beat a player. When you're on the wing, you might be protecting and you got to beat him down the line. It'll be a different move. So we've given them all these different ideas on how to protect and then escape. And so once a week, we have a program called Ball Mastery. All of our teams from under nine all the way up to our under 17s, they come and work with me and uh, myself and Christian. Uh, we do the Ball Mastery program. So. On Sunday and Monday, all the teams come through, they get, they get an hour of technical work. So they'll work on our core dribbling techniques. They'll work on the protect and escape moves. They'll work on receiving skills, our core skills. And, and, and we just combine it. So they'll go from unopposed moves to uh, semi-opposed moves to fully opposed moves within the session. Um, some are more progressed. Um, so we don't need to go through the unopposed because they've already learned it over a number of years. So we go right into opposed situations. But I know in the world of soccer, there's this whole idea that you shouldn't do opposed. But for us, we, we in Canada and you in America, same thing. We get kids that are nine years old that are beginners. If you're in Spain, that nine-year-old is quite advanced because their five-year-old is very is, is equivalent to our nine sometimes in terms of their understanding the game, uh, attending matches, understanding how the game is played, right? So if, if our nine-year-olds are at the same level as a South American at five or six years old, then we have to introduce certain skills that they don't have to because they don't get replication there. They don't get to, sorry, get role model and, and, and replicate the role models um, uh, ideas. So we have to be the role model. So in my ball mastery program, I'm the role model, I'm teaching them and we're going unopposed and, and there's no uh, right and wrong. When they get it wrong, we, we show them over and over, repeat, it's the curver model, right? But quickly we get into game situations. So I'll take skills and I'll show them on a chalkboard because in our little clubhouse, which is about 30 meters by 18 meters, we have chalkboards all over. So we'll draw on the chalkboard, random things. They'll come over, see the chalkboard. I'll show them a picture on the chalkboard. I'll write down things so it's visual for them to see and hear. Um, and then I'll be like, okay, you're a left back. Here's the situation. I'll draw it on the chalkboard. And this is how you'll beat the player in this situation. And so they start to envision it a little bit. Then I'll send them videos uh, of professional players doing these skills. And so that they replicate, they see it, and, and it's visualized in their head. And what's really been huge for us is Jed Davies does uh, every week with all of our under 11 and older uh, teams, they get a classroom, one hour of classroom. And the classroom could be on anything from how to develop uh, your own highlight video to do analysis of uh, a professional player to develop your own IDP, uh, individual development program, to um, how do you t manage time in a match, right? It, it could be anything, really. And so he, he has got a classroom every week. And so the kids in these classrooms are, are learning um, lots of our model, right? It's being presented, but they're also being able to see role models do certain things and he's talking through it constantly. So they're asking questions. And so I think that's been a huge part of our success is that kids, kids get classroom learning and then they get the feel of the learning as well immediately after the classroom because they go from Jed straight to me. So it's usually tied in. Um, ball striking 
this is um, it, it, this is obvious for all of you. You'll you obviously will agree with ball striking is is a huge part of the game, and so um, here's a little video. Uh, you'll see different types of passes uh, um, that are very important. So for me, ball striking doesn't just mean kicking a ball, right? Hitting a ball as hard as you can uh, with the inside of your foot or with your laces. There's so many different techniques. If you actually analyze the top players in the world, the Luka Modric's, the Lionel Messi's, you see the way they hit a ball. It's, it's an incredible. And South Americans, they can hit a ball with all different parts of their feet, whether it's toe, heel, outside, inside. So in our development model, we introduced these and, and we're very specific. It could be a scoop, it could be a chip, it could be a back heel pass. So I'll have a whole ball mastery session on how to do back heel passes and we'll create situations and scenarios where they have to actually go through it. Um, and I know, you know, if you, if you go on um, Twitter or if you follow different coaches, a lot of people will say, where do you include this in your, in your time to coach kids? My question is, where do you find time to do tactics with your 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds? Where do you find time to actually teach them building out of the back when your kid can't receive a ball in many different ways? Because well, when you pass small. the ball to them, it's never going to be the perfect pass. It's never going to be the exact same receive. So if I'm not teaching all these different ways of bending a ball or scooping a ball over distances or chipping balls or, or reverse passes or no-look passes, how can we build out of the back? How can a center back build out of the back if they're not taught how to drive diagonally and play the ball reversed, right? Because that is the game. That is building out of the back. And, and so in my ball mastery program, in all my training sessions, I'm going to make it very specific for position specific, even if it's U9. Okay, center back, you're receiving the ball. You're driving diagonally. And I want you to play it reverse. So now I've also all of a sudden worked on receiving skills. I've worked on driving with the ball. I've worked on head up. I've worked on my holding midfielder who's going to pull away. So teaching them how to create space, how to, uh, how to interpret space, how to break lines, and then how to receive the ball in that position when the reverse pass is played. So for me, that is, that is tactical development, right? It's all technical. It's all individualized. But it's the game that's going to happen. And in the game, when my center back gets the ball, she, you know, this one specific player, 2008, she's a girl playing my 2008 boys team, and she's playing on my 2004 girls team. She, when she gets the ball, she's told, drive and play reverse pass. That's your only objective in today's game. If you give it away every time, I'm okay with it. And every time she does it, I film it. I film the VO game on camera. I've clipped every single moment where she's driven with the ball and played it. And I've sent it to all the players. said, mm. this was her objective. Look at how many times she's done. Mate, who thought? Fucking hell. Right? So, so that's um, a little bit on the passing. What do you guys think um, when it comes to that? I guess my one question is, yep. um, like the age specific, um, could you talk more about, I guess there's a, a huge conversation, at least in our areas, when do you introduce passing? Or when do you introduce striking the ball? Or like, what does that look like, that process? Yeah, good question. That's, uh, you know, I had an amazing moment in my development when my child was four years old. And it was junior academy. And in that moment, um, I said to him, you see that ball? That ball is your chocolate. You do not share your chocolate. So he said, I can steal his chocolate. I was like, yeah. I was like, absolutely, you need to steal his chocolate. I was like, that's your chocolate. It's not his chocolate. And they were gold balls, right? So I was like, that gold ball, it's your gold. It's your chocolate. You never share it. And when you get it, you run like Lionel Messi. Remember how fast Lionel Messi runs? Because he was infatuated with Messi. I was like, you steal that ball and you run like Messi. And so this concept in my mind was, it was amazing concept because it might seem so simple, but I was like, sharing is not caring because they go to daycare, right? They go to, they, and they're told sharing is caring. I was like, in this world, sharing is not caring. I said, and, and as you, you probably know, if you think about uh, child development, there's parallel play. Parallel play basically means if you look at your uh, two-year-old child, three-year-old child, when one kid plays with a toy and the other kid plays, they're playing together. They don't ever share. 
It, it doesn't make sense to them in their mind to give you that toy. Because I'm playing with this toy. This is my soccer ball. You can play with your soccer ball. And we are playing, but we're not sharing. And in our world in North America, in Western Europe, and it, sharing is the nice thing to do. It's a proper thing to do. And when the kid doesn't share, it's a dishonor to the parent because parents are like, oh, I'm sorry my child didn't share with you. <laughs> Why are you sorry? The kid doesn't understand sharing. It's not part of their cognitive development. It's not part of their mental makeup to share. And actually, if you go on the soccer field at seven years old, they don't share. If you go to Brazil, they don't share a ball. It's a swarm. Anywhere you go in the world, it's a swarm until certain ages. And cognitively, between seven to 10 years of age, certain players will begin to pass and others will not. So why am I, as a coach, forced to tell that kid to pass the ball when cognitively, he's not even in that phase in the development. They're thinking, this is my ball. I'm not sharing with him because I'm not getting it back. They know that much they're not getting it back. So I'm now going to teach you, dribble the ball, master that ball, do whatever you want with that ball, make as many mistakes as you want because of your problem solving, you're naturally going to evolve and realize that I can't beat them. That's my teammate. I can pass it now. And when that aha moment comes into their mind, they're like, ah, I can do that. That's when I start to introduce the idea of 2v1. But that's different for your child than it is for my child. And, and I tell parents, I'm like, there's no such thing as hogs. So don't use that word hog. This kid that is keeping that ball and dribbling that ball, that is what they're supposed to do. And that's all they know. You as an adult cannot get in their mind and change that mindset. And so my parents on the sideline that see the kid dribble, 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 they're told very clearly constantly over and over again, that's normal. It's normal to dribble. Don't think that passing is normal. That kid over there, that many kids are quite developed that was born in January, and this one that's born in December, 12 months different, is a huge amount for them to be able to learn to pass and when to pass. So that's my belief. But in terms of kicking technique, my child also was learning how to kick a ball from the time they were 80 days old. So I have a video of him holding my fingers. I put a little Nerf ball from Ikea, $1 ball, and I had him hit the ball, hit the ball with his feet. And so it was like in the mind, you know, I'm, I was constantly teaching them kick the ball. And as he's one, he's kicking the ball. At two years of all age, he's able to hit a bicycle kick on a bed, right? And so that was normal in my world, in, in my child's world. Kicking a ball, I would tell him, run, jump, and uh, run, kick, and jump. Those are the three words I'd say. Okay, run to the ball, kick the ball, and jump. And then I watched the kid. I was like, naturally, he, they always kick with their laces because that's the way they're going to hit the foot. They're not going to open their hips up because as soon as you open up your hips, biomechanically, your hips open this way, your body twists that way, your shoulders, your head turn that way, right? So you don't teach the kid how to pass the ball. You just teach them how to kick the ball with their laces. They're going to do it naturally. And the one thing I learned from um, doing some research in Brazil, <coughs> when they play bare feet, they naturally learn how to kick a ball because when you hit the ball bare feet with your toes, it hurts. So I never let my kids wear shoes. I didn't wear cleats. We didn't wear cleats. We play barefoot. We still play barefoot because balance – proprioception, the feel of the ball, these were all things that were learned, right? The, the environment that was created. So when we come and bring our eight-year-old kids to the training session, some days we do a kicking technique. We go, okay, today bare feet. I bring a felt marker and I, I give them their foot and I'm like, okay, we're gonna go four laces up on your, on your big toe and I put a big X there. And when I put the big X there, I go, okay guys, go, we're gonna go kick balls, that X, is exactly where you're gonna hit the face of the ball. So the face is the ball, the nose on the ball has to meet the X. For one hour, we just kick balls. And they, they gotta look at their X and they gotta try to hit the nose on the soccer ball. So I've just kind of very, like made it very simple for them. And, and I feel it works. Um, and naturally, little by little, they start to learn. I don't know, maybe you disagree, I don't know. No, no, it's very interesting, the, the, especially what you were talking about with the sharing part. You know, I think it is, it's different kids reach the levels at different times. Um, never really thought about it in that way. That's good. Cool. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that we have is uh, our core skills. Uh, we combine them and we make combo series. So I'll go through this one. Is this one playing? Is that showing? 
No. Okay, let me do this one. Uh, Bush gets. Let's see. Okay, so this is the core. Okay. So this one. Here we go. Okay, so this is one of my players. Um, so this is a combo suit. Did you see it? Yes. Yeah. So he's uh, under 10, under 11. Um, and he's doing the combo skills. So these are eight moves. So basically I said to them, okay, I want you to film yourselves and then send it to me again seven days later how much you've improved. And, and, and the things I talked to them about was try to keep your head up, try to have bigger movements. Can we improve our vision of the field of checking your shoulder a little bit? And, and you'll see that it, it's not that improved really. But I, then I said to him, we're going to do it again for 14 days after this. And we're going to keep filming and filming. And we're going to keep watching how our, our head goes up, how big you get in your movements. Because if you do these little moves in a tight space, the defender is going to go right through you, right? But if we can stretch them and then we can speed up our movements, we can exaggerate them <laughs> perception through our hips and arms and pointing and looking, then it starts to become a move. And then the kids will say, but you don't do this in a game. You don't combine these moves. I'm like, absolutely not. You, ne you don't really combine these ever. But because you're so comfortable in going from one to the next to the next, over time, as you get comfortable doing this, when you get in a situation, you might pull one, two, or three things in a situation that you didn't think about, and they just naturally happen. Right? And so this is our whole idea of creating combo series. And so there, there's a number of different combo series that we've come up with. There's the core combo eight. There's the, the, the combo, the, the Bushkets combo. And this is, this is the Bushkets combo. This is a V series. So you'll see there are a lot of V movements. So where they pull, they push, they do Maradona to do a V. They pull with the sole, they push the inside, outside. So if you look at Bushkets in the midfield, Bushkets is always pulling these moves to escape pressure. So these are protecting escape moves, all right? So part of the combo series, uh, you know, I'm just trying to get them to do all these little V movements. Because if you go this way, maybe you entice the player to come here, then you quickly get out that one. So th th that's the, the Bouchquette series. And then there's a Messi series. And the Messi series is obviously Messi's the role model for everyone. It, it's, the, it's a combination of um, Lionel Messi moves and um, you can see it, right? <laughs> so this is a combination of uh, Messi moves, Ronaldinho moves, a Brazilian broken leg type movement, uh, and, and this is very difficult. The, the kids will struggle. Like the first move is a, dra a drag move that Romario did, and most kids don't do it properly. And so I'll, I'll correct a lot of the stuff. So what you'll see in this, you won't see it done properly, but over time, give me two weeks, three weeks more, they'll start to introduce the moves a little bit better. So. It, it, it just keeps them going with different ideas. I'm always presenting something new. And, and the next one could be, okay, you got to come up with a position specific combo series for yourself. If you're a attacking mid, what would be specific to you that actually works in the game? Not just what is fun and flamboyant, but what actually works. So now independent learning again, now they're designing their own thing. Any questions regarding that? Okay, then the, uh, a, a very important part of our development, obviously, again, is, is the receiving skills. Um, so here, this is actually in my basement um, working. And so what I do is I try to introduce lots of um, receiving skills, but I also use role models. So in the academy, it's always role models that are used. So this is a Ronaldo, this is Zidane, or this is Messi's receiving skills. And so I'll send them videos so they can watch them. And then in the ball mastery program for doing it, they've already envisioned uh, Brazilian Ronaldo doing a certain move, right? They've seen Zidane doing around the corner. So now when they get to the session, okay, we're going to be doing around the corner. You remember how Zidane did it when he played for Real Madrid? That's how we're going to do it here. And, and then the player might say, oh, well, I have a different way of doing it. I might do it the inside of my foot. I'm like, yeah, perfect. So I'll give them an idea on if you're doing it with the inside foot, it's going to be with this foot. It's going to be your left foot, the furthest foot away. But if it's with the outside of your foot, it's going to be inside of the foot or the inside foot that's closer. So I, I try to go to core skills that are the core that I believe are very important. But at the same time, I also give them, well, as soon as we go into semi-opposed, opposed, I never tell them that they have to do that specific move. I tell them, 
use whatever move that makes sense in that moment because when the ball's delivered six inches this way, you can't do that around the corner. It has to be a choice move uh, on the other angle, right? So if I introduce the skills, at least they now have the opportunity to problem solve using whatever they've learned and more that they can introduce. Um, so, but there's times where I'll, I'll be like, okay, we got to work on this specific one and here's a poll and this is how we're going to do it. So that's the unopposed part of the training. Um, the core receiving skills for me, I think uh, it, when I look at the 4R model, which is um, receiving, retaining the ball, running with the ball and releasing the ball. And, and that was a model that was presented by Dick Bates, who used to be the uh, head of the English FA. He also came to Canada and was our technical director for Canada. And so he presented that early on when I was uh, pretty young in my coaching. But I took that, I was like, that's genius. Four R's, I can cover every single technique that there is within the four R's, right? When you receive a ball, what are the different ways to receive? Is it on the ground? Is it in the air? What parts of the foot? What parts of the thigh, chest, head, back am I going to receive with, right? So I came up with like all the ways to possibly do that um, in receiving. Then running with the ball. What are all the different 1v1 moves? So I ended up coming up with uh, 72, uh, 78 different things. And I was like, that's, just, that's too much. That's too much. Let's come up with core. So that's where this whole core skills model has come from, right? Like I've made like a whole model, like here's all the possible movements. Now let's narrow down to what's really important. And then let's work off of these important movements where the kids become flamboyant and, and, and present their own idea. Um, so now before you receive a ball, obviously you gotta be able to move off the ball, right? And, um, I've got Jed Davies to thank for this because Jed Davies is, is a tactical guy, right? He understands tactics. And if you've read his book on Bielsa, where he's, um, he studied Bielsa and he's going to come up with another book, part two, um, Bielsa is very big on movements, right? Movements off the ball. And movements are, are, should be taught from the day or the first day because if you're going to receive a ball, how are you going to move? How are you going to show for the ball? Are you going to pull away from the ball? Are you going to show to the ball? Are you going to run in behind? Are you going to run and cross the player? Right. So if we can use those four specific types of movements, from there you can create lots of different movements. Right. If I pull away now, or am I working on my ABCD? ABCD being angle. So is my angle right when I pull away? Yes, my angle's right. My body shape, is it right to be able to see the ball? Is it, is it right to be able to go where I'm gonna go with the ball? So I've got my angle right, I've got my body shape right. Am I C, am I checking my shoulder? If my body shape is right, I'm seeing the ball over there, but am I checking my shoulder to see defender, space, and my teammate? And then as you get advanced, are you able to check your shoulder to calculate time and space? Right? How fast is that player going to get here? How fast am I going to get there? And then D is distance of everything that's around me and the decision of what I'm going to do with it. So within this receiving, you know, without, within the movement of the ball, I have to get all those A, B, C, D right. Angle, body shape, check your shoulder, distance, decision. So I am always saying A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. Uh, when we're moving off the ball, when we're receiving the ball, A, B, C, D, because your angle's got to be right all the time before you receive. Right, so uh, movement of the ball, we do a lot, starting from our young kids from U9. Uh, even if you think of our U3 and U4 kids, we play tons of tag games where you're evading the player, right? So you're moving, you're moving this way to lose the man. So 1v1, how do you lose your man? Can I fake left to go right? Everyone does it, everyone knows they're doing it, but maybe it's not part of your model that you're actually cognitively aware that you're actually producing movers from the time they're not, uh, three, four, five years old. But then you can start introducing move lose your man so it could be like i as a coach have a ball your parent is your defender how can you fake him out get over here and i'm going to pass you the ball to catch a ball with your hand so there's your physical literacy right so you can introduce that four years old or you could do that in at nine years of age where we're working on passing where one player's passing one defender is, is stationary they're looking to see where that attacker is attacker is losing him and you lose the man right very simple um but I think it's I think it's really important. Um, what do you guys think about what do you guys think about losing the player, moving off the ball? I like how you describe them as movers. You know, we're looking for kids that can move, moving right, um, <clears throat> and um, just that 
that comfort and fluency to, to, to start, to stop, to backpedal, to escape. You know, you saw that one movement in there where the kid was, you know, balls played in, he's being man marked, and he made that little double movement. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of kids, you know, don't do that kind of stuff. And so you have to create, create, the, create the opportunities for them to do it. So, no, it's very good stuff. I think the crucial part is knowing where to move and when to move because you have several options, but maybe one option is better than the others. Mm -hmm. So how do you teach that? Well, I think, I think that's the coach's job to, to guide. I think we talked about a guidance before, but I think that it's sometimes it's trial and error, you know, because it's, it, it, and it will only work with certain players, I think at certain times, certain players will pick that up at an earlier age than other players based on their natural aptitude and their mentality. Mm. And the culture they, they may be raising. I find that difficult. I, I find that, um, I think you're in a different situation, Sanjeev, than, than a lot of coaches and that, you know, you've got different levels of players. I work with a certain level of players that, mm. that it's, I, I have to reduce things to the most basic element of form. You know, we have, for example, 10, 11 and 12 year olds that it would be very difficult to teach movement off the ball. In, in, in the way that, I mean, your boys, they were flying. Great, great teaching, I think, and that, but, but for us, it would be a lot slower and, and a lot simplified. You know, baby steps first, depending upon the level and the abilities of the players that you're working with. Mm -hmm. okay. I definitely love the tag. I think the tag is, is a, a very powerful tool to use to be able to teach that. Um, I also was reading some stuff about limiting your players choices to kind of force creativity um something i've been toying around with in our training sessions you know if you limit their choices then it forces them to solve the problem in different ways that's cool i think if you limit them yeah you're right you have to solve a certain way but if you if you expand it and say come up with whatever way you want that's another way as well so well, yeah, probably bounce both ways, right? One day limit, one day provide options. I think that's really cool. Like in those 2v1 situations, yeah. a lot of times I think coaches will jump into the bigger game really fast. So now the kid is like, well, I got to pass here, or maybe pass here, or maybe pass here. If you limit their options to get out of situations, mm -hmm. like you talk about the center back, you got to find your six. Mm -hmm. Well, how am I going to do that? Like, well, now you got to, this is where you get creative. Yeah, you got to solve this problem. Yeah. I agree. The next part of the model is 2v1. That, so it's cool. I got a video here. It's really cool. Uh, very simple video. You'll notice this kid on the ball looks one way, opens his hips up the other way, but plays that reverse pass. It seems so simple, but the deception there, it, it's, for me, is it's world class. This is the kind of stuff that you don't see enough, right? So the kid's on the ball. Right here, you'll see right there, he's kind of opened his hips up to go across the field. But at the moment that he releases the ball, he actually slips in behind. But if you look at that pass, and I'll put it again, if you look at the weight of the pass, it's part of the whole deception, right? Like he's played it into the path of the player um, because a lot of times kids will just kick a ball, right? They won't think of the weight of the pass, the type of pass, uh, the, the message in the pass, is it to the right foot, is it to the left foot? So for me, this 2v1 situation, for me, this is where now soccer becomes, it becomes a soccer game, right? Obviously, it's 11v11 is 1v1 games all over the field, but you always want to create that 2v1 to have the numerical advantage. So in this situation, you've seen that. And then here again, you're going to see another deceptive movement in the 2v1 situation. Is you'll see, so you'll see here, if, if you, I'll, I'll play it through one time. And then it'll look like you're going to shoot, but if you really analyze this, it, there's so many cool movements here. So what you'll see here, the goalkeeper, you see the goalkeeper is ready, to, ready for that shot, right? But the last moment, the hips allow for the ball to get played across. So there's your 2v1 situation of deception, right? The, the player needs to look up. They looked up at the goalie to make it look like they're going to shoot. I think these, these things in the game for me is where the game really gets exciting. And the two of you want, and I'll show you one more. This reverse pass here. Oops, sorry. Um, 
And here you'll see a few different deceptive movements here. So you'll see the first one on the dribble where he deceives the player, and then it's on the cutback pass. Right, on the cutback pass. So there's a deception there again. So for me, the game is all about creating deception at some point to be able to buy yourself space. As soon as you have space, you've got time, right? And so once we've got time on the ball, decision-making becomes so much easier. So I think sometimes what happens is um, deception isn't really hit upon. It's not a work. Oh, my wife's, my wife's hitting me in the back. Here. She's telling me, calm down, calm down. <laughs> Um, so she, she made me lose my track of uh, my train of thought there, but deception, I think, um, it, it allows us to buy ourselves time, it allows ourselves to um, create space and, and see the game a little bit more clearly. Um, don't miss one. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'll go into um, modified pressure. Um, this is kind of a cool video. I think you'll like it. It's from Atletico Madrid, actually. Um, it's a little defending video. So I was, this is cool. So I came up with the same concept at home. So I'll throw a cone, and you get a react, and then block the shot. So it's not really opposed. But I've added some goals to make it feel like it's a competitive game. So it's, I call it modified pressure. Um, so for me, it's important that we modify the pressure just to give the kids some ability to have success before we add in real team players or opposition um, to play against. So in this situation, all it is is you're just screening the pass, right? But it's fun because you gotta, you got to react to the color. So there's a little bit of awareness. There's a decision making on where do I got to go? And then it's how agile are you to be able to get up and, and, and slide tackle, right? So nothing big, just a fun little drill we did. And I did this with our players in the training session, and they loved it. They just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, so it's a lot of fun. And, and I saw that Atletico Madrid was doing it, and so I, I applied it for my kids. Um, there was one video I had that was really cool that basically summed up everything. And I don't think it loaded, but I'll, I'll find it on my Dropbox here and, and get it over. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, can I ask a Make question? Sure they, uh... Yes, yeah. please. Yes. If being like the one-two combination that you were talking about, also, uh, the player could be creative on that one-two sometimes, you know, when you're about to score, the defender is coming to you. You can do that one-two against the defender. Uh, Kenny and I would play with this great player, uh, Nene Cubilas. The defender will come, and the player is running. He will do the one-two combination with the defender. So he hit the leg of the defender, go one-two, boom, and score. So sometimes those kids got to be creative on, on things like that too, right? Sorry, I didn't understand. So, so when you're talking about a one-two combination, yeah. when you, look, you, can, you can create a one-two combination also, like you out of pass with the defender. So the defender is coming to cover the pass, and you hit the leg. When he planted the leg, you hit the leg and hit him, and then you go, you do the one-two combination with the leg. We used to play Luis with this Fred. player. Yeah. You must so, be from I mean, Uruguay. No, I'm from Peru. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's about being creative with, with a one-two combination. It's like auto, auto, one-two combination. You use a defender. You hit the defender, the ball comes to you. So it's like creative, you know? It, it yeah. sounds crazy, but if you actually, there's something. No, no, about, no, it's, it's real. <laughs> it's real. I know it's real because Luis Suarez actually talks yes, about that. He does that, that in Uruguay. That's, and he actually does. If you watch him in games, you'll see him do it. Something. You're like, the guy is so unorthodox, but it works. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah well, right. Nene Cubillas used to score goals like that. And Kenny Fogarty played with him in the strikers. He was brilliant on that one to come. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. I know these these are the cool things I think that are part of development that aren't really touched yeah, upon, right? People man. think it's kind of crazy. But these are the little nuances of the game that make your player become the professional and mine not become the professional, I think. Yeah. Um, so this this is really important. This game here for me basically sums up everything we've just discussed. It's a it's a very simple one v one game. And I think worldwide every single coach should be doing it. 
um, whether it's U9 or whether it's your first team professional player playing for Houston Dynamo in the MLS. Because here you're going to see movement off the ball to lose your man. You're going to see body shape to try to play the ball forward. You're going to see players moving off the ball to provide passing channels. You're going to see creativity on how do you beat your man, right? Do you protect the ball? Do you escape them? Do you play one-on-one -on -one to beat them in front of you? Is a defender behind you? Is a defender on the side of you? Right, all the different angles that you're going to get in a game situation in one v one, you're going to get Good right game. here, right. And so this this is the game I play constantly, all the time with all of our age groups, Good. Good and, and just try to bring out all the coaching points, and then build it into a two v two game, into a three v three game, right. And, and and then you start bringing in principles of of play, right, or width and depth, obviously. But um, for me, the individual model is completed within, you know, this game. It, it, you've gotten everything. The deception, right? Like a no-touch turn where you pretend like you're going to touch. You step to the ball, so you add disguising. You're receiving, right? You, you pretend like you're going to receive, but you play first touch forward. And then your movement immediately following after you pass the ball. What do you do after? So you're thinking ahead. I've already played forward. Where's my next movement? Because if you watch, most kids, what they'll do, they'll pass, but they'll stand. You know, in this case, the kid actually moves very well after he passed, right? But they usually watch the ball after they pass the ball. So he's moved right away to lose his man. Defensively, you get everything as well. Do you, are you trying to screen the pass? Or are you trying to get goal side of the player so that he can't go forward? So you have to make decisions. Am I going to screen the pass and see what's behind me and what's in front of me? which is very difficult to do, or am I going to get goal side and I'm going to prevent him from turning and always make him go backwards, right, which is good defending as well. Um, are you going to play ball side? Are you going to try to step in and win that ball? Are you going to try to play on his strong side so he plays to his weak side? There's so many defending concepts that are involved in that one. Any thoughts on that, guys? When you play those games with the targets, do you allow the targets to pass to each other to create sometimes. a different? Okay. <laughs> the progression in this game sometimes is okay. Um, it's this team now, the three of you versus you three, and every time you play it in uh, across, then you jump in, or whenever the guy on the outside receives, it jumps in. So now we're just trying to get the ball to the other side by either driving or playing one touch. So it's all about seeing the open space. But you, you can vary it up in so many different ways. And I don't think there's any right or wrong. Whatever's good for that moment for your needs, right? Yeah, definitely. I just know sometimes, especially with kids that kind of like what the other guy was saying, that aren't as mobile, then the defender will just sit there in front of the, the player. For so sure. like you said, different ways to, to create what you're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone's level is going to be different, right? All the, all the players that are playing are always at a different level. So, but our job is to fulfill their potential, right? Every one of them could become movers. They're young enough that we could teach them. It's just that they don't do it, right? If you tell them double movement, go this way to go that way, they get it. I always talk about, you know, cookie jar. I'm like, look, you're, you, when your parents put the cookies in a certain spot, you're very deceptive and able to get those cookies because they're finished by the end of the week and they don't know. They didn't give you those cookies. And at Christmas time, somehow I always found the Christmas present before Christmas Day because I was always looking. I was, you know, where's my dad? He's over there. I'm going to go look for it, right? So you're always trying to give them some ideas on how to lose their man. Any, um, so that, that, that basically, I know I've had tons of your time and, and that basically sums up our model and we didn't get through a lot of the other things that um, I think Paul wanted me to talk about, but uh, all I can tell you is in our academy, a um, couple of little things is that I have this idea that I'm going to produce players to play professional, international and university level. So we are literally a grassroots club. We don't have a facility. We got to find facilities here and there to rent. Uh, but we have this Los Galacticos idea that we're the biggest Real Madrid, you know, in the world. We're, we're the next gold mine effect or, or you know, the, I call it the Viking effect. Like, if you think about Iceland, they have 364,000 people. That's, that's one-sixth, one-eighth of, of, of Houston, right? That's uh, one-third of Ottawa, right? And so for me, I'm like, Iceland has a concept. They came up with a philosophy and they were able to go and tie Argentina in the World Cup, they were able to, you know, make effect in, in, in the Euro Cup, right? So how come we can't do that? We can do that, right? 
we can do that. So uh, I think that whatever you give me, I will do something with. Uh, I will uh, produce some players that will get to the next level. So right now, for example, we just graduated our first graduating class. And out of all that class, we had uh, 14 kids, 13 went to university, one chose not to. So 12 went to university, one went to Greece to play pro. Right in the next age group, we've had a kid that's captain team Canada at the World Cup. At 2003, we've got the youngest kid to ever play in Canada at the at the professional level, 15 years of age. Now plays for uh, Ottawa Atletico in the Canadian Premier League. So I feel that we can get players um, to the next level. And for me, the next level is MLS in North America. It's Europe, right? So. We've had our two um, 2004 players, an 05 player, go to Vancouver Whitecaps just the past couple of weeks. We've had a 2004 under 17 kid sign with Lazio um, this summer as well. So I, I just feel like that's our job. You know, we need to get kids to that level. So that's what we're trying to do in that, that mm -hmm. whole mission. But uh, Sanjay, the same is Uruguay. Uruguay is the tiniest country in South America or in the world, only 3 million people and produces so many great players. Uruguay. Coming from India. Yeah. How about soccer? Because you guys have a culture, right? An environment and, and, and an environment that, that creates players. No, but it's still mandó para Jalic. Yeah. 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 End of the day, for me, all I could tell you, guys, if you could, uh, if you could please mute yourself if you're on right now. Thank you. We'll let Sanjeev uh, wrap it up here. Mm -hmm. So my final thing is that for me, smaller is greater for us because it allows us to have personal touch on every single player, every single parent, have a connection, and and it's been told to me a number of times from different parents, like. Hey, you, you know everyone. It's amazing. And, I, and, I, and I'm like, yeah, of course I do. I'm supposed to know everyone. That's my job. But then I go back and I think about what they say. I'm like, yeah, that, that, I guess it's amazing because they come from environments where there's hundreds of kids, thousands of kids, where the technical director doesn't know them. The coach doesn't know anything outside their 16 kids. So for me, smaller is greater because I now have a family. I have a ability to impart my knowledge on every single player and not let players escape and get away and, and just fall by the wayside. So for me, that, that, that's been the trick on, on being able to produce players. And this project for me will finish uh, when I produce and, and ultimately when I produce two Champions League players, this project is over and I will be on to something new, hopefully. I don't know what it is, but that's my dream and that's, that's what's gonna get accomplished. And then I'll be moving to Houston to work for Dynamo. Sanjeev, you're hired. We'll bring you on. Yes. Quality, quality over quantity, right? Yes. Mirko, that's exactly it. So that's what we're waiting for in Corpus Christi. Back, <laughs> back, back to the So if you can, you, you, you and, you and uh, Sanjeev doing that quality would be incredible. So Sanjeev, thank you so much, man. That was an absolutely Great. awesome presentation. Dude, honestly, I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years. You're an example for, for every youth coach out there. Everyone claims to develop players. Everyone claims to know soccer. They've played in the past, all this, that, and the other. But the reality is very few player, very few coaches really develop players. I mean, develop players at that individual level. And I think it's quite honestly, and I'm being honest, I think that's, that's a big problem in our country, you know, where we can improve, or I should say an opportunity in our country, right? And I think you're a great example of what it means to be a developmental coach. And man, I'd love to have you come back for a part two at some point and show us the rest of those videos. But Be nice. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I'm sure everyone here. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I didn't want to really do this because it was, uh, I don't want to tell people anything. I just want to learn, 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 right? But I hope you got something out of it. I'm glad you guys stuck around. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was very nice. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everybody for coming on today. Really, really appreciate you coming on. And, you know, we'll do this again. Uh, you know, if you don't follow Sanjeev on, on social media, you definitely should. Um, Sanjeev, do you have your, uh, your, yeah. I, I, you know what, I can, I can send it out as well, but, you know, yeah, that'd be nice. If you share that, that'd be great. And, and uh, you definitely will want to keep in touch. And you're welcome. We do this every month. We'll have another guest on next month. Um, but Sanjeev, we'd love to have you come back again. And I'll be joining, I'll be listening. I'll be listening to the rest of the guests going forward. That's great. 
Well, when you do get those two players to Champions League, then you, you come to Houston. We'll yeah. find something for you here. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank Enjoyed you. it. Thank Enjoyed you. it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Good, good day. Thank, thank you, guys. guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Coach Paul. Take care, guys. Sanjeev, that was awesome. Yeah, Paul, thanks so much. You want, you want to chat for a few minutes? And sure, sure. Give, give me a little.